Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Community United Methodist Church. Those of you who are here in person and those of you who are watching online, we welcome you this morning. Um, just a few announcements to start with. Mary Martha's will meet Tuesday in the fellowship hall at 9 a.m. So if you are one of the women at the church and would like to be a part of that group, um, Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Um, the Isaiah 117 house um, had an exciting week. They broke ground on the house on Thursday. And if you look in the bulletin, they are having a pie fundraiser. So those of you who may not like to make pies for Thanksgiving, this is a great opportunity for you to buy pies and support um, the building of the Isaiah 117 house. Um, the Mountain Mission truck will be here Tuesday, so if you have last minute items, you can bring them to the church tomorrow before 4.30. Um, there's a blood drive um, going to be here on the 29th. The way the Red Cross is doing this now is you must make appointments ahead of time, so please schedule those if um, you are willing to give blood. I think I have mine scheduled. I don't remember what time, though. Um, Toys for Tots. Um, the Marine Corps is asking this year, instead of us bringing unwrapped um, toys, that they are collecting money and they were going to buy the toys themselves. So if you look on the Welcome Center, as you come in and out, there is a little container that you can just drop a cash or check donations in there for the Toys for Tots this year. Um, Youth tonight, we will not meet. I think we have several youth that um, are anxiously waiting for their moms to get home from Ghana, and some of them will be headed to the airport to pick them up. But traditionally, we don't meet during fall break. So since this is one of the fall break weeks, we will take this week off. Um, Spread the Word Bible Study is still going on on Wednesday nights, and then the Tuesday morning prayer in the chapel, and you can watch that online as well. So you could either come in person or you could watch Pastor Darren online on Tuesday mornings. I think that is all our announcements. Good morning, and let's pray, shall we? Good morning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together today. Wherever we are, Lord, we lift our hand to you saying thank you for all that you do. Lord, bless and anoint us now. Strengthen us, encourage us, challenge us, and guide us in all that we do from today throughout the week. And Lord, to you we give the praise and the glory. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. All right, everyone stand up and worship with us today.
You may be seated. As we enter into a time of prayer, we have a lot of prayer concerns this week. Um, we want to be in prayer for the Marvel family on the death of Bill. Um, his funeral was yesterday here. Um, Gloria Keller is in Good Samaritan Hospital with COVID-19. Um, we've had reports that a lot of the nursing homes have been hit again, so please pray for them. And, those, and the members of our church that are residing there where they have limited contact with, you know, anyone else. Um, you know, short visits through a window is not the same as having your family get to come in and visit with you. Um, pray for Alice Carey. She is able to get out a little bit now, but she is still struggling with her broken leg. Um, Patty Dryman is at home recovering from her eye surgery. Jim Dryman is in Evansville still, so please continue to pray for him as he recovers. Marge Miller has, um, is still in good Sam, but is in rehab now. Um, Bob Freeze is recovering at home, so please remember him. Um, we also want to continue to be in prayer for Val, Rachel, Marcy, and Michelle as they travel home today. They should be home sometime this evening. Um, and from all the pictures on Facebook, it looks like they had a really good time, so I'm anxious to hear all about that trip. Um, also, Frank Johnson has moved to Fox Ridge. And Mary Jane Brown, who's Melvin and Betty's sister in Kentucky, needs our prayers. So let us prepare our hearts and minds as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for all the good things you have provided for us. We praise you for our family, friends, jobs, and homes. We thank you for this church and the, abil and the ability to worship here in person or at home. Lord, we pray for the family of Bill Marvel during this difficult time. We lift up those we have mentioned previously who are in the hospital or recovering at home. Give them strength and put your healing hand on them. We ask for travel mercies for those who are coming home from Ghana and those families who will be traveling during this fall break time. At this time, let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I want to take a few moments now to give unto the Lord of our gifts and tithes and offerings. So for those who have not done so already... Let's uh, turn to the Lord and give as we are able. Thank 
Father, Lord God, we thank you for the bounty that you have filled our lives with and the opportunity to give unto you, Lord, freely and joyfully. Bless and multiply this offering, Lord, to your service and to the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Children want to come down for children's time? red light. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of farmers in this community, right? Does your dad do some farming? Yeah, I thought so. This one's got a green light, so it must work. Okay, so you know, we got a lot of farmers in this community, right? A lot of us know farmers. A lot of the farmers, you know, when you look out here, I know we've got some farmers. I look up in the balcony, I see some farmers. Well, here's a little story about a farmer. So this old farmer sat on his steps, and some, this guy walked by and said, how's your co cotton crop this year? And he said, I ain't got one. Farmer said, the, the guy said, well, why not? He said, I didn't plant any because I was afraid the bugs would get to it. Okay. So the farmer said, well, how's your corn crop? Or the guy said, how's your farm crop? And the farmer said, I didn't plant corn this year because I was afraid that we wouldn't have enough water. So basically the farmer didn't plant anything because he was afraid of what would happen. Now, what would happen if the farmers in our area didn't plant any crops? They would die. They would die. Why would they die? Because we have to have eat. We have to eat, don't we? So we need those farmers to plant that food, don't we? 
Yeah. So what would happen in the same thing? What would happen if our church, in our church, if all... Right, you got to have food for energy, don't you? You know, but what would happen in our churches if all those workers decided they weren't going to work anymore because they were afraid? They were afraid that maybe no one would show up for Sunday school, so I'm just not going to teach anymore because no one's going to show up. Or what if Pastor Darren decided that I'm not sure I like this sermon, so I'm just going to stop preaching every Sunday? What would happen? We probably wouldn't have very many people showing up for church, right, if there wasn't a reason to come. What if our musicians decided they weren't going to work anymore? You know, we were blessed the last two Sundays to have our youth leading the, the music. But what if Rex decided that he wasn't going to play the organ and the piano for us anymore? What would we do? You know, we like our music, right? We like listening to the music at the beginning and end of church. Yeah. So... You know, it takes all of us to work. And there was a scripture in Luke 10, 2 that says, He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. And, you know, he wasn't talking about the farmers. He wasn't talking in the scripture about sending them out to actually harvest the crops, although we do thank all the farmers for that. He was talking about all of us going out and spreading the word of Christ. And so if we don't go out and do that, who's going to do the work of the Lord? You know, Jesus, but we've got to help him, don't we? Yeah. So you've got to tell your friends about Jesus, don't you, Everett? You know, you've got to invite them to things like to Sunday school or Bible school and those kind of things. For the older kids, it's inviting their friends to youth group. You know, things like that, that's our job. You know, God asked us to go out and do those things. So let's say a little prayer, okay? And you guys can repeat after me. Dear Lord, help us to work for you every day. Amen. Okay, and I think it's time for you guys to go to prayer and praise. Hey, what? If a farmer tried to uh, do all his work virtually, would that make him a farmer in the Dell? Maybe. If only we could get Nolan up here that fast. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, before we uh, start the uh, the sermon here, I want to share a song with you. Now, this song is kind of dedicated to all of you that might be a little more shy when it comes to sharing the Lord. Uh, and as fun as this is, it's not an excuse not to. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, have some music. I'm gonna let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm gonna get beside of myself when I get beside the king that day. I'm gonna have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. Well, I don't know why I become a little shy when I get around a whole lot of people. And I can't figure out why I never can shout about the love that floods my soul. I must confess I can't express the feelings down inside me. The things I know and cannot show one day will overflow. I'm going to let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm going to get beside of myself when I get beside the king that day. I'm going to have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm going to get carried away when I get carried away. Well, I'll pass the clouds and I'll shout so loud it may sound like thunder. My tearful eyes may fill the skies until it feels like rain. As I leave this world past the gates of pearl to stand before the Savior, I'll lift my soul, let the glory roll, and from the roll he calls my name. I'm going to let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm going to get beside of myself when I get beside the king that day. I'm going to have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm going to get carried away when I get carried away. I'm going to let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm going to get beside of myself when I get beside the king that day. 
I'm gonna have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. I'm gonna let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm gonna get beside of myself when I get beside the king that day. I'm gonna have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. Someone give the Lord a praise. That'll make your foot thump. All right, so our next two sermons are going to kind of wrap up everything we've been learning. Now we're going to talk about how to disciple people in our community. And we're going to begin with Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20, a passage I'm sure many of you have heard. So, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Now, if you don't recall, the context here is this is not too long after Jesus' resurrection. He's been showing himself to uh, different folks at uh, various times. And now we're getting to the last moment before he ascends into heaven. And so there's some that still don't quite get the fact that he is alive. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, we're a long way away from Jerusalem right now. And here we are some 2,000 plus years later, and we know somebody's been doing their job because somebody shared the gospel with somebody else who shared it with somebody else and shared it with somebody else. Our job is to make sure that does not stop. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey just some of the things I've taught you because that'll be good enough. Right? No? Okay, your Bible don't read that way either. It says, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end end of the age no matter what comes no matter what may God will be with us now from our earlier sermons we know that God has called us to be disciples we've heard that call we've learned what's expected to be a disciple and what God is wanting us to do we've learned how to share that knowledge and disciple our families and now as I've mentioned we're going to learn how to share that with our community Four easy steps. The first is to keep ourselves in tuned and aligned with God's word. Gather together with other believers. That's the first thing we got to do. This is an obvious step. However, there are many who call themselves Christians who don't understand the necessity. The necessity of meeting and being together in church and in small groups for worship and discipleship, for ongoing growth as a follower of Christ. Imagine you're going to the hospital. You need to have your heart operated on. I had a gentleman once told me, he says, you know, it's an amazing It's an amazing thing, but it's also a very humbling thing and an even scary thing to know that somebody in just a little bit of time is going to cut open my chest, pull my heart out, and set it on top of my chest and work on it and put it back in. I mean, how amazing are we created that that can even happen? But now you're needing that operation, and your doctor, well, he attended class, And he did pass the boards, but hasn't done anything else since. Hasn't looked at the latest techniques, hasn't practiced. You know, well, I, you know, I, I, last time I looked at one of those, you know, it was on a cadaver, it was 
20 years ago. Uh, how many of you want that person cutting you open? <laughs> Nobody? Yeah, no, not me either. I want somebody who's learned and practiced and knows what's going on all the time. We want that all the time. Hebrews chapter 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold unswervingly. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. How can we encourage one another to continue sharing and living Christ Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Ruh, ruh. Guess what, folks? Not new. It was happening back then. Even years after Jesus was gone. You know, it was still within the first century. Folks would decide, oh, I'm good. I've had enough. I'm cool. That's like saying, you know, I don't need to eat this week. I had some breakfast last week. Those Cheerios, they're holding up. I don't think so. <laughs> After a while, you got to feed that thing. <laughs> Spur one another on towards love and good needs, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And folks, if we don't think we're getting a little closer today, then I don't know what's going to convince us. Number two, we got to be a model. For Christ, model a Christ-centered life. A very important factor in discipling others is our own worship and our own discipleship. If it's not important for us, it's not going to be important for anybody else. It has to be a priority. That goes back to some of our earlier sermons. We are called to be a model of Christian living both in word and in deed. You can't just say, oh, well, I don't say much because I live it. There are a lot of people out there, very nice, very loving, very kind, never say a mean word. But they will see the lake of fire and not the heavenly realms because they did not give their life to Jesus. Unless you give your life to Christ, it doesn't matter how nice you are. It doesn't matter how good you are, how much giving you are. A lot of nice people are not going to find themselves living eternally with the Lord simply because Jesus is the only way, the truth, the life, and the path to God. So we're called to model that Christian uh, behavior in word and deed. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be benefit those who listen. All right, here's a, here's a passage. We could preach on this thing all day long. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. If we've ever had that opportunity, oh, wait a minute, excuse my French. Hey, don't blame the French for our poor choices in words. <laughs> I wonder if there's any folks in France that are going, oh, excuse my English. <laughs> excuse my English. Hmm. If we have to ask people to pardon what we're saying, then we probably need to reconsider what it is we're saying. And with that, the things that should come out of our mouths, and again, there isn't a person here not guilty of this here, uh, or of not doing this anyway, only let those things come out of our mouths that are useful and beneficial. We want to be helpful in building people up according to their needs and not tearing them down according to ours. Because typically when we're putting someone else down, it makes us feel better. Well, at least I'm not like that. <laughs> we don't want to go there. So get rid of the unwholesome talk. Say those things that are helpful for building people up and that it might benefit those who listen. Because again, as Christians, if we're modeling that Christ-like behavior, there are non-believers around us that are looking at how we behave. And if they see that we're doing things just the way they do, then their excuse at that point is, well, why do I need to change? I can act like that too, and I still get my Sunday off. 
if our behavior is unchristlike, then our witness will also then be ineffective. Our commitment to God must be complete. Without that commitment, we play God for a fool. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Guard your steps when you go out to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. See, now here's folks he's talking about that actually go. They went to the temple. But they were going for their own benefit and to do their thing the way they liked to rather than to do what God required and what God asked. They were making the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven. You are on earth. So let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares and many words. Mark the speech of a fool. And we've probably all seen that person and on occasions been that person. We need to ask ourselves a few questions here. Does our talk of being a Christian exceed our walk? Does our talk exceed our walk? Are we truly living for God, living by God's word, or are we just paying God lip service? As we think about these, consider this verse, and this is from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 4. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. True story, when I was in the Navy, uh, we had uh, our annual evaluations. And for some reason, I don't know what the deal was there, the, uh, oftentimes the supervisors would hand the evaluation to the person being evaluated and said, here, fill this out. <laughs> I thought, you were evaluating me. Anyway, I'm talking with my supervisor, and he's filling out this evaluation. And, of course, this always has an, a, an impact on whether we'll get our next promotion and whatnot. And so he's filling this out, and he says, hey, do you do anything in your community? Uh, well, no, not really. Uh, do you go to church? Yeah. I had been there once. <laughs> and he wrote that in there. Later on, I'm looking at that thing, and I'm thinking, hmm, you need to, you need to do something about this boy, because this is, this is going to be a problem. I was still very new in my faith. I've been praying. I've been reading my Bible, but I hadn't been attending church, and we were just kind of getting started a little bit. And after I read that, I said, you know, I cannot not go anymore. I've got to get in and... Although I said I was doing this, in retrospect, I need to go back out and start doing it. And that led me to becoming a pastor, <laughs> the short version. That one remark in that uh, evaluation got me thinking all the more about what it was God was calling me to do. So be very careful what you tell God, because he will expect you to fulfill it. And as in my case... Boy, well, he wasn't kidding. <laughs> so, when you make a vow to God, do not delay in to fulfill it because he has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. Now, we're going to be talking about those vows here in a little bit, too, so hang on to that. So, in calling our Christ ourselves Christians, what have we vowed? We have confessed, number one. We have confessed to God all of our sins and our weaknesses. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all righteousness. So we have vowed this. Next, we believe, we've made a, a vow that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Romans 10, 9 and 11. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Next, we believe, we have confessed 
that we believe uh, that he died on the cross for our sins. This again, a vow that we've made. We believe this. We've accepted it. John 3, 16, we all know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And next, we believed he descended to hell and defeated death. Revelation 1, 17 and through 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This would be John. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look. I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. We also believe and confessed and vowed that we believe that he rose from the grave. He ascended into heaven. John 14, the first three verses. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, that is Jesus. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for each of you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that where I am, you may be there also. A next vow we have, we believe that he sits at the right hand of God awaiting the time of his return in the final judgment. Mark 16, 19. After the Lord Jesus spoke to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 2. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge Paul or Timothy says here preach the word I should say Paul says to Timothy preach the word be prepared in season and out of season correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction another reminder to share the word and then we also have the vow that we have agreed to follow God's will and not our own Remember we say it in the Lord's Prayer all the time. Not my will, but your will be done. How many times have we said that in our lifetime and then went ahead and did whatever we wanted anyway? Eh. John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Mark 8, 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We've covered that one earlier on as well. In John 13, verse 34 through 35. Now with all these passages, now you know where we got the sermon notes. So if you don't have them, you can download them online there. John 13, 34 through 35. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. So just a little side note on that one too. People don't have to know God to love others. People don't have to know God to love their family. People that don't know God don't need to know God to love their friends. But if we're going to love people who have hurt us, if we're going to love those who have let us down, if we're going to love people no matter what, if we're going to love our enemy, we're going to need God. That's a witness that's going to get people's attention. See, it's being able to do more than what the average person does, powered by the Holy Spirit. That gets their attention. Love one another. John 15, 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. So, now, we've made all of these vows about what we believe, what we've done to accept Jesus as our Savior. Now, for some, we have also made other vows. In membership here in the church, we have made vows. We have made vows to the Lord, and we've made vows to support the church with our prayers, with our presence, with our gifts, with our service, and with our witness. 
we have stood before the congregation and said, Lord Jesus, this is what I'm going to do. Now remember, he said, don't make vows without thinking. Don't be hasty. Say what you mean, mean what you say, and then go do it. And so if we're doing all of these things, we should then be producing that good fruit, which is, as we all know, more disciples, more people coming to know Jesus. We then have to ask this, do we keep the commandments of God? Do we keep the commandments of God? Do I keep God's commands? Do we keep the vows that we made at our conversion when we accepted Christ and we confessed all the things that we believed about him? His life, his death, his resurrection, his commands, his word, his will. And do we keep the vows we've made as members of the church? And so one thing I like about the vows within the church, uh, within the Methodist church, is because you're really making, uh, you're, you're not vowing to do anything that God has not already asked us to do anyway. It just happens to be in this particular context. When we keep and live these commandments, we are then on our way to sharing our faith as confessing believers and followers of Jesus who have confessed their sins, asked Jesus into their lives, we have accepted then the call to bear good fruit. We've agreed to fulfill our calling to make disciples of the world for Jesus. You carrying all that now? So far then, we've learned to carry out our calling. What we've learned to carry out our calling is we need to gather together with other believers and continue growing as disciples. We have to be intentional about our faith development. That means being in worship, being in the scriptures, being in prayer, being in service. And we've also learned about modeling a Christ-centered life. Letting other people know that it's not just talk, that we're serious, we mean business. We're going to follow Jesus no matter what, no matter where, no matter how. That's two of the four. We've got two more. And we're going to look at those next week. The final two steps, sharing our faith. Some have never done it before. Some aren't sure what to do. Some have. They've seen it. And there's nothing more amazing than looking in the eyes of a person and their heart in that moment when they go, I get it. I, I understand it now. And their eyes and their heart are alive. So we're going to learn how to share our faith. And then we're going to learn how to share the plan of salvation. That's coming up next week. For now, though, we need to embrace and live into the things that God has revealed to us today. So that we can help be prepared for what is to come. We each know where the Spirit has convicted us in these areas and where we may fall short. The scripture has given us a direction on how to move forward and to fulfill our call as a disciple, which means now is our opportunity to decide to make those changes, to receive through the Holy Spirit the ability and the strength to make those changes in our life that we need to make. Remember, it doesn't matter how old we are, it doesn't matter how long we've been in church, or how new we are in the faith. God can use each and every one of us. Therefore, it is with humble hearts then, as we have in our previous weeks, we're going to join together once more in the uh, covenant prayer uh, that uh, Wesley put together. And so again, I encourage you that as we pray, think about those things God has been revealing to you during all of this. Think about those things God's wanting you to be and how God wants to bless your life. And think about those people around us who don't have the hope that we have, who are looking at a world that's filled with pestilence and plagues and war and hate and disunity and wondering what's going to happen next. We have an answer. God has an answer, and he's asking us to share it. What will your part be in helping somebody new come to Jesus Let's pray. Lord, I am no longer my own, but yours. 
Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low by you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. In the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. In the name of Jesus, amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we have said this prayer once more today, wherever we are, Lord, let your Holy Spirit electrify our hearts. Fill us, O Lord, from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head with that anointing and unction, Lord, to function for you, to be the disciples you have called us to be, to be the disciples you have created us to be so that we can share that good news with others, that they too can be your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. All right, can you stand for our closing song?
Amen. Can I get a hallelujah? Oh, why don't you say it like you mean it? Hallelujah. There you go. Shout through that mask. Make it vibrate a little bit. Oh, Lord, we do thank you and I pray, God, now that you would bless and fill each one here, Lord, and wherever they may be with your Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen and amen.